Let me participate and I'll tell you who I am. So that's a quote by Anton Pickles. And for me, that embodies what it means to play and what I enjoy about play. Because it's that moment when someone shows you their other side. Yes, that is a tomato. So I'm going to share with you a story of a time when I got to understand about my other side. I used to co-run an arts organisation, and we were invited to create a game for a country show. The game was called Tom Tom Tomatola, and you grabbed a tomato, you recited a scripted verse, and you threw that tomato at a person in the stocks. But very early on, people got tired of the rules and it descended into an out-and-out -out tomato fight. And by the end of the afternoon, it was the arts team versus a group of 10-year-old boys. <laughs> and the 10-year-old boys were decimating us. And there was one boy in particular who pulled out these Jason Bourne moves and started to pick us off one by one. And then at that moment, our sole focus was how we were going to take down that 10-year-old boy. They won. <laughs> but what I learned was that children really teach you how to play. And prior to that, if anyone had asked me, what type of player are you, my response would be, I'm not competitive. I'm more interested in how the game works, how it's put together. But in that moment, I learned that I am competitive and I want to win. <laughs> so my name is Inveneke and I create spaces for adults to play. So a question I'm always asked is, what is play? And it's a really important question. And I think that we need to acknowledge that everybody plays differently. And that play is pre-verbal. We play before we can communicate. So that means that it's an ancient structure within our DNA. And I also believe that as adults, we don't play enough. But if you Google play, there are about 36 different definitions. Pretend play, play with objects, guided play, and competitive sport. But if you ask me to define it, I define it by not defining play. I like to refer to Stuart Brown, MD's Wheel of Emotions. He describes play as a process, and as a set of emotions that we all pass through when we play. Anticipation. That moment before the game starts and the cards are being dealt. Curiosity. When you look around the room at the other players and the setup, and you're wondering, how does this game work? Pleasure. That moment in the game where the dice rolls and the numbers that you've wished for suddenly appear. Understanding. That moment where that rule that you never quite understood, you're able to use it to get ahead in the game. Strength. You're getting a bit tired, but your eyes on the end game, and that powers you on. And lastly, poise. The way you're able to keep your composure, because you've got a great hand, and you don't want to give the game away. I believe that as adults, we need to redefine play for ourselves. I'm excited about technology and the possibilities. I'm excited about mixed reality. I'm excited about augmented reality. I'm excited about meta and what we can do. And I really do believe that technology is the way forward. But in moving forward, we need to make sure that we are not leaving people behind. Because technology should be used as a vehicle to create moments. Technology is not the moment. It is a tool for liberation, to reconstruct these new physical and digital spaces so that everybody can play together. A great example of that was during COVID. 
we all learnt to play together using Zoom and stay connected remotely. In my own practice, I had to make an adjustment. I went from making games with technology in physical spaces to moving my practice online. And it went from national to international. And I played with my friends in France, I played with my friends in Spain, and I played with my friends in America. And one thing I began to realize was, a lot of people are scared of playing games because they believe that they have to arrive with this comprehensive knowledge of how to play and the technology. So I started to explore how I could create a game that used a common play language. And the only qualification that you needed to come to the table was to be able to have a conversation. That game was called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And it explored scenarios and commonalities and differences. And it seemed to work, because I think it's important for the people that you play with to feel seen, understood, so that they can play together and enjoy it. I want to talk a little bit about play equity, because when I first started to explore play, I discovered that play, in its origins, is colonial. And it's not, it hasn't been created by people that look like me. As a child of immigrants, our parent, my parents came here, and they had to be seen to be respectable. They couldn't be playful. Could be, to be playful was often taken as someone who's not serious. So they, and they had to assimilate and fit in. So for myself, and for many of us, our parents didn't play with us. And that meant that we didn't inherit that generational play. I started to explore the stats for who had access to play outdoors. And what it revealed was, in the UK, one in eight households has no access to a private or shared garden. And that drops to one in five in London. And black and brown people are four times less likely than anyone else to have access to an outdoor space. So when you see black and brown bodies outside playing together in public, understand that that is a political act, and one that also carries a lot of risk. What we need to think about when we're building these new physical and virtual play spaces is, who gets to play? Who designs what we play? And who sets the rules about play? So that means not just thinking about how are we going to get black and brown people into our spaces? It's about ensuring that your audience has a mix of people designing and building these new play spaces. And it also means, in the spaces themselves, we need to ask ourselves a few questions. We need to ask, do the audiences feel safe in our spaces? Do they feel welcome? Are they able to turn up as their full selves? Do they have the power to speak? And can they say no? Does a space have cultural context and visual references that people can recognize? And that happens by ensuring that you have people on your teams that understand and recognize cultural nuance. Because cultural nuance is important. And I'm going to share with you a time when cultural nuance was lost. I was invited to create a game for a district in London. We found this great celebratory story of a 16th century Moor, a black man, who came to the UK rich. He was a chocolatier to the royals. He owned a big district of, of the, the borough he lived in, but he also built houses for the poor. So that was a great story to give back to the people in that area. But when the first artwork came back, it was of a hooded, cloaked figure stirring a cauldron with two tower blocks in the background. And that is an example of what happens when cultural nuance is lost. Again, to the future of play. So the future of play is a place where we should all explore and create together. It's intercultural, and it's intergenerational, and it is a space of co-creation. 
What I'm working on right now is an ex immersive experience called Heroes, Villains and History. And I'm partnered with UCL, Coding Black Females, Colour in Tech and Meta. And we are multiple voices in the room with a myriad of perspectives. Because play is a place where we can reconstruct the institutions within us those norms and those biases that sit within all of us right now. So I want to reiterate, the future of play has multiple voices. It has radical new methods, it has new perspectives, it's intercultural and it's intergenerational. And it needs to be that way so play can be a place of genuine celebration. So if you're as excited as me about some of the things that I've spoken about today, come play with me.